Good afternoon, uh, Martin Laughlin, the Good afternoon. senior judge of the United States District Court for the District of New Hampshire. And uh, uh, I've gotten your prior permission to refer to you as Marty. Correct. Is that the nickname by which you're known most? That and SOB. <laughs> <laughs> Not by many, though, I yeah. would imagine. Uh, Marty, would you uh, uh, give us a brief uh, uh, bio on your uh, uh, growing up and your family? Well, I was born on March 11, 1923, in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, I had one brother who uh, passed away last year. Um, I went to Highland Grammar School, uh, St. Joe's High, St. Anselm's College in Suffolk uh, Law School. I joined the 10th Mountain Division on February 1st, 1943. I was with them for nine months and I was transferred to the 80th Infantry Division, uh, which later became part of the 3rd Army and I was uh, in the liners in combat for nine months in World War II. The highest rank I ever achieved was corporal. I made sergeant once and got busted. Um, what did you get busted for? Uh, not doing an officer's bed, I guess, or something like that. And then I, on graduation from uh, Suffolk Law School, uh, in 1951, and the day after I took the bar exam, which was June 30th, 1951, I was on a morning report at Fort Benning. I re got recalled in the Korean War. So I went down to Fort Benning, just got married a year before. And uh, when I got down there, they found out that I had passed the New Hampshire bar and they detailed me to the JAG. And I did all defense work for about 18 months. How did you get interested in the law originally? Well, actually, that's a good question, uh, Willa, because I was a pre-med. And my, I got to be frank, my marks weren't that great, so I went on to law, you know. And uh, the last year at St. A's, I got out of there with 148 credits because I had to make up, take different courses, uh -huh. you know, histories, and to, to have enough credits to get into law school. Uh, tell us a little bit about your folks. Oh, my, my father and uh, my father worked for its Tidewater Oil Company and it's now Giddy Oil, and my mother, um, she worked at the VA, she worked at the post office, and at the old Grenier Field uh, during World War II. And my mother is still living, she's gonna be 92 in uh, December. Uh, my dad passed away about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was f a former professional boxer too. Professional boxer? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. What yeah. Uh, division? Uh, Bantamweight, 118. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, you had one brother who Yeah, Tom, who died uh, September 21st of last year. And what did Tom do? Tom was at the telephone company for all about 32 years, yeah. Okay. yeah. So uh, I guess uh, with all this talk about uh, family values and the like these days, uh, uh, you have uh, no apologies to make in that regard? Well, I forgot to mention the most important thing. I'm married and have seven children. Well, I was just going to get to that. Yeah. Right. Six girls. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they're all girls. One boy. One yes, boy, yeah. yep. Uh, and uh, tell us about your kids. Well, my oldest, uh, Helen, is uh, a nurse. And she was in intensive care, but she hurt her back, so now she's ask a nurse. And uh, my daughter, Peggy, uh, Margaret, uh, the second one is also a nurse. And uh, my son, Shane, is a, a mechanic. And uh, Mary's a housewife and a waitress. And Sheila's a housewife, and so is Martina. And Caitlin is finishing up at Plymouth. Uh, Marty, that uh, is a, a good introduction for a perception that I hear out in the uh, uh, profession and the community uh, that uh, you are a very uh, nice guy. What would you say if you were your uh, tombstone read? Uh, Martin uh, F. Laughlin, nice guy. You've been talking to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not your own perception of yourself? No, I don't think so. I, I try to be. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to, to make a statement like that. Yeah. I'm going to take you back to, uh, I think, uh, 1963, uh, uh, Marty, uh, to the uh, Plymouth uh, 
courthouse of the Grafton County uh, Superior Court. You were there with your partner, uh, Broderick, and the defense right. counsel were Hugh Bounds and uh, Bill Batchelder. And you were plaintiff counsel. A presiding justice was uh, Bill Grimes, and the sheriff was Herbie Ash. Got a good memory. And you had a little girl that you were representing. She was a teenager at the time. And she was walking along the shoulder of the road, I think on Route 3. And a, uh, the defendant came along and was said to have been drinking. He was an employee of the uh, dairy up there. And uh, he was the insurance defense counsel for the American Fidelity Company. A guy by the name of Bill White was the adjuster. And uh, Bill Batchelor was there as overage counsel. The highest verdict ever obtained uh, in Grafton County up to that time was $15,000. Do you remember the case? Very well, very vividly. Tell yeah. us about it. Well, uh, actually, the credit goes to Jim Broderick. He was my partner. He tried. Um, I did the, some of the medical and uh, the law and the openings, but uh, Jim did most of the work on it. And uh, there's a kind of a humorous anecdote to that. The night before, um, the case was going to be argued. I think it was on a Thursday night. Uh, I had taken my car up, and Jim said, you know, can I borrow the car, go down and get a six-pack of beer or something? So he went down, and he come back. He said, why don't you take a look in the back end of your car? And I did. It was all caved in. I said, what happened? He said, well, I got to this little country store, and the, the lady in the store said, uh, I have a 16-year-old, and I think he's too young to get a driver's license. What do you think? And Jim says, I agree with you. He says, you know, they're too young, they're not mature, and I, I think you're right. So he got in my car and backed into a telephone pole <laughs> with her on looking. Huh? Yeah. But about the case itself, um, uh, I remember one, one fast, I remember that case very well, is of course, uh, <clears throat> Hugh made an argument, and when he made the argument, it was a very good argument, and there's nothing to object to. And uh, subsequently, when Jim was arguing, uh, Hugh had to object. And he objected three or four times, and one of the jurors later on said, well, you know, it wasn't very fair. Uh, Jim brought it, let him argue without yeah. interrupting, but he interrupted Jim. Mm -hmm. So I think we get 75000 yeah, I, it was my recollection yeah. was sixty-five. Uh, well, maybe sixty. Uh, I, I like to embellish uh, it somewhere around <laughs> that. But it was uh, a June day. It was a day almost like today, which yeah. is a gorgeous, uh, bright day. And and Herbie Ash came uh, uh, hobbling out because he, as you, he was an ex-marine with right. only one leg, right? And he uh, uh, came out. I think after the jury had only been out for maybe a half an hour at most. Probably, yeah. yeah right. And everybody assumed it was the defendant's verdict at that point. And that was the highest verdict, I think, uh, up to that point in Grafton yeah. County. And well, all credit goes to Jim. Jim did the yeah. lion's work of that well, lion's shape. Yeah. Continue to be self-effacing yeah. here. Yeah. Are you? Uh, try to draw you out on the other side, uh, uh, Marty. Uh, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, you were appointed to the Superior Court. And would, would you have been appointed in 63 or 64? September 9th, 63. So it was shortly after that case right. uh, that you went on the Superior Court. Right. And you were appointed by uh, Governor King. King. Yeah. And I assume now, uh, Marty, without knowing that you grew up with John King. And, and just, no, actually, you know? uh, I didn't really know John. It was a, we had both gone to St. Joe's High, but he had graduated. I think there's about seven years difference. I see. And that's a big difference when you're a kid. How did you get the appointment? Well, I got to be honest. Sure. <laughs> I was his campaign manager with Bob Denae. I think that had something to do with it, you know, in, in Manchester. And when he first offered it to me, I, I uh, rejected it because uh, the salary then, believe it or not, was $16,000. And, you know, I had, at the 63, I had four children. Mm -hmm. And I had made substantially more than that. And, uh, so I reconsidered, and I talked it over with my wife, and uh, give a lot of credit to Jim Broderick, because Jim said, look, if you don't like it, come right back, and we'll still be equal partners. So, And that, that day, September 9th, is, uh, that's the day that uh, I got married, too, in 1950. Uh -huh. so, things seemed to happen on that day. 
And you were at the Superior Court for some 16 years? Yeah, till I think May of 79, I think I came up here. Finishing as Chief Justice? Yeah. yeah. Now again, earlier I said that I would uh, try to bring perspective of what I hear in the community. Uh, the perception of the, the bar was that you became a, uh, a very serious student of the law, the rules of evidence. And uh, some would say that here's this uh, a bright young fellow who's now suddenly faced with having to rule on all of these things, and he better get up to speed. Uh, would that be a fair observation, Marty? I think so. And what I had done, well, it is before, um, when I was practicing law, I, any case and evidence I thought was, you know, important, I briefed and kept in a, a little uh, book, booklet. And in fact, I think, Margaret, you've probably seen them when you were here. I still do it. And it's now grown to, with the federal rules to about eight volumes. I see. Yeah. Of your own uh, notes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in that connection, uh, you did uh, uh, put out uh, a uh, two-volume uh, series called The uh, Trial Practice. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that, Marty. Well, actually, that was a culmination of what I started with the evidence and then uh, uh, you know, it's just general on general uh, trial practice, and I think in the book is a uh, brief summary of domestic law, criminal law, and instructions. It's, it's not that great a book. I'm going to test your memory again. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, I was around for that uh, case uh, in Plymouth that day as I was a young uh, lawyer working with Hugh at the time. and. So sometime thereafter, when you went on the bench, I remember you sitting in Belknap County, and there was a, uh, a gentleman there who was making a claim uh, against uh, another party for an employment arrangement. And uh, the uh, claimant uh, had been a trooper in the uh, Massachusetts uh, State Police, and his claim was that he had been enticed away from his employment and had lost uh, his retirement benefits and the like. And you were sitting hearing this evidence. And the, during the cross-examination, it was brought out that he uh, was terminated for uh, disciplinary reasons at the state police. And uh, do you remember that case by no, any chance? No, really don't. Mm -hmm. Was that yours? Yeah, but what yeah. you did, Marty, uh, which was instructive at that time for a young lawyer, was that you uh, very quickly closed up. You had your uh, notebook. And you closed it up and looked at the parties and said that you were leaving and going into chambers and that when you came back out, you'd expect that the case would be resolved. And uh, tell us about that as a style. Did it work? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, and I only use that anecdote uh, to try to bring out your style. Well, well, I like to, you know, I like to see the cases settle like any other judge, but I don't like to force somebody. In other words, your professionals. And if it gets to the point where you think I'm just leaning on you too hard, I, I back off. That's always been my way. And uh, I've seen other judges, I'm not without getting into names, as a lawyer and also as a judge, where they practically browbeat the attorney or their clients to settle a case. That's not my way. Uh, if I get them to the point where they, I know there's no hope, well, I just let them go and try it. Yeah. In fact, that's very evident in this case. I had them this far apart in this case, but they just wouldn't move any further. Tell us about your uh, recollection of some judicial figures in uh, New Hampshire, or either at the state or federal level. That Well, um, I think one of the greatest judges I ever met is Frank Henderson on the Supreme Court. You know, he, of course, you know that, but he's well-renowned even today throughout the country. You know, he's very far-sighted, and uh, he innovations in the law, and he was just a tremendous jurist. And another one I had great admiration for, he could be quite hot-tempered at times, but he's a great judge, was John Leahy. You remember John? Oh, yeah. 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 And when I went on the Superior Court, I, uh, I had a great relationship with him, but he was a very... And of course, I think the judge that I had liked to try before was Bill Grimes. You remember Bill, too? Yeah. yeah. Now, Marty, uh, you ultimately uh, became the uh, Chief Justice of the uh, Superior Court. 
And uh, who was the governor that... Uh, Bush uh, Thompson. Yeah. You know, I'll give him credit. I mean, you know, I'm a Democrat, and uh, there's a question, uh, of course, he's a Republican, and uh, uh, he was very gracious in uh, appointing me. Uh, give us the uh, background scene on that, or the... Uh, were you uh, actually interviewed by the governor? Yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I was interviewed by him. Yeah. And your impressions? Uh... He was very fair in, uh, to me, and I thought he was very gracious, as I stated. Yeah. I think, uh, what would you say about his uh, appointments generally that he made during yeah, his I think he made some great appointments, right. you know, uh, really did. Including Justice Souter, I think. Uh, oh, God. did he? Yeah. I well, think so. enough said. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was with Dave. Dave was with me for about two years in uh, a little anecdote. In fact, Dave will tell you himself is when he came on the bench, he didn't have a uh, robe, so we borrowed mine. So, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, Patty, uh, what was the toughest thing you had to do as a Chief Justice of the Superior Court? Uh, you know, that's a hard one. The, the only thing I remember as chief judge, one of the problems I did have is that, uh, in fact, I was sitting up in Belknap County, and um, Bob Carrigan was a master up there. And I got done about 11 o'clock, and Bob had three or four domestic cases. And I went in, and I, I helped them. And, I remember having a vote on it, and no, I said we should do the more domestic cases, and I got shot down 12 to 2. You know, I thought if um, if we had the time, we should attend to them. Of course, you got your marital masters now, but to me, uh, domestic cases, as much as we didn't like to try them, were the most important cases, I thought, mm -hmm. on the docket. And that, that was, that was a, you know, I was just a little bit chagrined that that happened. So the Superior Court was very much a democracy at that point. Oh yeah, you actually a chief judge. You you know you it was a democracy, and I the only one I had with me was Charlie Carnes, <laughs> who uh, had been a long time clerk and right, understood right, the practicalities right, right. of it all. Yeah. Uh, have you been following this new uh, concept of uh, a family court that they're going to uh, pilot in Grafton and uh, uh, Rockingham County? I've heard about it. I think it's a good idea. The it, idea there, uh, I might be interested in your thoughts, uh, are that uh, the uh, Supreme Court is going to designate uh, uh, members of the probate district and superior court in those counties uh, to uh, handle any case of a domestic nature, whether it's a domestic violence, a divorce, or a juvenile delinquency abuse, or status offender kind of case so that they would be designating judges who are interested in doing that, and then the judges could move amongst the courts as long as it was a family-related case. Well, I hasn't Phil Holman volunteered to do it? Uh, Phil has uh, been designated by uh, uh, Chief Judge uh, Netto to head up the uh, domestic division of mm -hmm. the Superior Court. Oh, I see. And this is a, a legislative initiative uh, because the courts themselves couldn't agree on how to how to handle that. Well, I think it's a good idea, okay. especially to get volunteers. Okay. And I think the marital masters, from what I hear, are doing a uh, great job. And they would be involved in this process would they as too? well. Oh, yes, well, I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to. Yeah. Uh, they, so you could uh, have a, uh, a judge in Plymouth, uh, let's assume Judge Kelly, uh, mm -hmm. uh, could be hearing a, a case involving a, a juvenile turns out that there's a family issue, a divorce, so that Judge Kelly would handle all aspects of that family's uh, dysfunction. Whatever would he nature. stay with the case? Yes. He's, well, that's a good idea. Yeah. Because I remember one time um, I had a domestic case, and at that time there was only eight judges. And of course we circuited more than they do today. They still circuit. And of uh, the eight judges, six had sat on that case. And, you know, you just had a take the file and go over it again, and it'd be better if it had the same judge on it. But you couldn't do it because you're, you're moving around. Mm -hmm. There were a few cases where I, I made it a point that I'd come back to the county, uh, a case uh, similar to that. Mm -hmm. I think this is an excellent idea then. 
if the judge is going to keep the same case. That's what happens up here, you know. We're assigned the case and we keep it. So you've lived under both systems, uh, the circuit system uh, and also the single docket or whatever they call it system. Mm -hmm. And uh, your comment about that is that? Well, I got to be fair because we don't have the volume of cases. The most cases I ever had, which is quite a few, I had 490 civil and a full criminal load at one time. And it's easier, but when you're moving around, say, to uh, Coas County, then back down to Nashway, uh, you, you just can't do it. And the volume they have in the Superior Court, as you know, is so great. It, it's not feasible in time, at times. Would you be supportive of a, uh, a rule or a procedure where uh, Superior Court judges would be uh, assigned to a county and uh, with a specific docket? Uh, let me tell you about that. Um, I think it's a bad idea, and of course, when I say this, you've got to consider I'm not criticizing judges in Laconia or Manchester who sit there all the time, but in the Superior Court level, I think it's a good idea that they move around. And, you know, you might get some animosity or, or between the attorney and judge, and I think moving around is a better idea. How do you equate that with the situation in the federal court, though? You where can't. You know. I can't equate it. Uh, the only thing I can do up here is, I suppose, if I had a, and I haven't had, I've been lucky, um, but if you had a situation such as that, of course now there's five of us, but before there's just Shane and myself, he, he would take the case. If you were feeling uh, grouchy yeah. with regard right, to that right, party or, right. or practitioner. They felt, they felt bad about me, yeah. I see. Now, uh, I've asked you what the toughest thing was that uh, you had to do as a chief judge, which was to deal with that decision on the uh, marital cases. What was the most pleasurable thing? As a chief judge? Yes. Oh, working, working with my fellow judges. I had a great bunch. There were 14, I think, when I left. Was it 29 now, I think? Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, Hearkening back, and uh, uh, this uh, goes back quite a way, but I think you were uh, a judge with the demonstrators up in Dartmouth College. I think that was about 68 or yeah. 69, yeah. And uh, you came in for some real hot press on that issue, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, uh, let me tell you something about that, which is amazing. I got over 800 letters, and six were critical. And I answered every one of them. It took me about a year and a half, but I answered them. The 800 or the six critical? All of them. All of them. All of them. Some were unsigned. Marty, Some were unsigned. Uh, this uh, uh, interview is for the purposes of uh, archives and the like. Uh, tell uh, our future audience uh, the kind of the background on that case and your perception on it uh, then and then has it changed at all over the years? Is that a fair question? Yes. Um, if you can recall, it was the, there was a, a spate of cases throughout the United States. In fact, just before the Dartmouth College case, there was some judge, I think it was Viola down in Harvard, they had a sit in there. And um, the Dartmouth cases, uh, well, do you want me to give you the real background? Yes, that? that's right. Well, what happened, and he, one of my favorite people is Herbie Ash. And uh, uh, they were going to have a sit-in, and I think it was Go Governor Peterson was the governor, and uh, uh, as you state, there was a lot of publicity about it. And um, the attorney general came in with the, uh, a, a temporary injunction to keep him out of, I forget, the building. Now, they were protesting what uh, at that point? The Vietnam War. Okay. And so Herbie Ash was the sheriff. Who, Herbie was the sheriff. Who was the attorney general, do you recall? God, I don't remember, but it was, we got a uh, petition for injunction from the attorney general, and I think... Could it have been George Papagianis? Maybe. And I think, yeah, I think you're right. And I think Diamond kind of took a neutral viewpoint on it, if I remember. And um, I signed the injunction. And I left Woodsville about 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night. I think they were supposed to be out of there by 8 o'clock. 
I may be wrong on my time. And I'm coming down uh, 93 and I'm uh, approaching the toll gate at uh, Hookson. And there's about eight state troopers down there waiting for me. And they said the governor's on the phone. And uh, I got on the phone and he, he says, you know, he was, what are we going to do? This is uh, Governor Peterson. Governor, I says, I've signed that petition. And uh, I said, I gave it to the sheriff. I says, is, is Herbie Ash there? And he says, yes. In fact, Herbie was on the other line. Now, Herbie was a uh, uh, decorated uh, veteran of World mm -hmm. War II and Marine lost Marine. his leg in the Marine Corps. Right. Yeah. And so uh, I said, Herbie, you got the injunction? I said, it's 8 o'clock, serve it. And he, I don't know how much of this should be on the record. No, it's all on the record, but it should be on the record <laughs> because this is for uh, serious research in the well, future, uh, Marty, and so well, better right. to be open and frank. Well, Herbie, um, I thought the governor was vacillating, and Herbie was so glad that I went ahead. You know, he was there, and he was, I don't forget how many troopers and how many uh, deputy sheriffs he had there, probably 50, 60 people, and these people were just making a mockery of him, and he was glad I backed him up, put it that way. And I can understand Governor Peterson's perspective, but I felt I had issued an order. I'm, I'm not going to change it. And then you had uh, these uh, students in on contempt. Right. And you uh, did what? I had 45 I incarcerated for 30 days. And were there appeals from those uh, contempt Yes. Findings? Oh, right away. Right away. They went right down the First Circuit. The First Circuit was meeting. This part I remember vividly was meeting at Wentworth by the Sea. And I think Bailey Aldridge. The judicial conference? Yeah. Right. And they, I remember it was Bailey Aldridge, I think, uh, um, refused the appeal. Yeah. I forget who their counsel was at the time. Oh, maybe Backus. Yeah, Bob Backus. Yeah, Bob Backus, I think it was. Yeah, Bob Backus and somebody else. And my recollection, and you correct me because I'm going by memory now, uh, Marty, uh, he was a little bit contentious at that point in time. Well, he made some remarks at a bar meeting, uh, and um, and it was overheard by me too uh, that, uh, well, <laughs> that were not too complimentary, and uh, uh, I felt as a matter of course uh, after what had transpired that it'd be fair to him that I get out of it at that point because there were another ten, I think, and Dick Dumphy come in, Dick Dumphy come in and handle the others. I see. So we just had a, a difference of opinion, and I felt it would be better for me to be fair to everybody if I recuse myself. Mm -hmm. right. Now, uh, Marty, uh, that was obviously, uh, you were right in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have the benefit of the uh, almost uh, 30 years since then. Looking back, uh, uh, what are your thoughts? I do the same thing today okay. without any equivocation. Now, uh, let me preface what my next question by saying that uh, I th think that Walter Peterson has been probably the finest governor since I've been in New Hampshire. And, Great and guy. He's such a gentleman. But uh, Walter had a reputation for being uh, indecisive at times. Is that unfair? Well, I don't know about that, but all I know of that particular evening is that I, he could see the ramifications of what was going to happen. Because, you know, that was nationwide, eventually. It was a it was confrontation. All over, oh, all over, yeah, a confrontation. And, and I issued the injunction, and Herbie Ash was there to do it. And I just, I'll be frank, I said, it's out of my hands. Mm -hmm. As soon as I signed that and gave it to the sheriff, it was up to the sheriff. I'm going to go on to another Walter Peterson anecdote here. And again, this is for archives purposes and for serious scholars in the future to try to put perspective on them all of us back here in the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Walter Peterson was uh, governor at the time that uh, uh, George Grant was a senior uh, justice of the Superior Court mm -hmm. and was uh, uh, designated uh, or was the heir apparent to be chief judge. Yes, Were you seniority. on the Superior Court Oh, yes. At that time? I went on, when I went on in 63, there was uh, Judge Grant. Leahy, myself, and poor Denny Sullivan. Remember Denny? Denny, Denny was very ill. Yep. He died shortly thereafter. 
and Bill Grimes and Tom Mars right. and Bill Keller. Do you remember the flap about uh, uh, Judge Grant becoming chief judge? Yes. Uh, you want to record for posterity your recollections of that? Well, I actually don't think Judge Grant really wanted the job. You know what I mean? I don't think he really wanted it. Um, I liked the man. He had some, like all of us, he had some foibles. Yeah. And, um, but I, I actually, and I think what happened there is I think that uh, Walla Peterson handled it very well. I think that he asked him, did he want it? He wouldn't have appointed him and gave Grant the chance to say, I don't want it. Uh, let, me re let me f refresh your recollection a little bit because I'm interested in your perception as a colleague of his on the bench at the time. Not so much about the person, but the process. Uh, Governor Peterson actually put his name up for confirmation by the Executive Council. Oh, did he? Yeah. And uh, the uh, uh, then Executive Counselor from uh, Manchester. Uh, had uh, complaints uh, that uh, uh, Judge Grant may have been abusing alcohol. Mm -hmm. And the question was asked at the confirmation hearing of George Grant, is it true, Judge Grant, that you have a couple of martinis at lunch? And George Grant looked the person right in the eye and said, yes, sir. I didn't realize that. Yeah, and then the nomination was withdrawn, and uh, uh, Bill Keller became uh, chief judge. I never actually, well, I never knew that he actually went. I thought that he they gave him the chance to refuse, you know, so he wouldn't be embarrassed, and that he said he didn't want it. Yeah, I didn't realize that. And I think that's interesting, the uh, my memory and your memory, yeah. because uh, in effect, uh, your memory is probably very accurate that he really didn't want the job. Uh, but it was proffered. He was a senior judge, and there was a uh, a, uh, a tradition then that the senior judge right. became the chief right. judge. Right. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, uh, at the time that uh, Governor Peterson uh, asked David Nixon and myself and several others to come in because he had uh, been dealing with the question of whether or not to uh, nominate uh, Judge Grant for this, and uh, several of us were concerned because while he was probably as bright a judge, he had certain uh, practices in the courtroom that didn't uh, go over well with the trial bar, whether that was fair or not. That was an observation. Mm -hmm. And after hearing everybody, and not waffling, but really, uh, and I, I'm unfair to Peterson, uh, he was very thoughtful about things, so he didn't shoot from the hip. He called us back and said that he had finally decided to nominate Judge Grant and he was doing that because he had talked to uh, Frank Kennison, and Frank Kennison said that he ought to nominate George Grant. That speaks a lot for Frank Kennison, doesn't it? Yeah, I didn't realize that. And Walter Peterson. Did I have? I guess I had a great misconception of yeah. what happened. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I see. I, I think you did have a because I'm not sure that Grant really wanted it, but mm. it was kind of tradition. Sometimes we get pushed into things we really don't want to do. Well, he was not an administrator, and yeah. you have to be. Right. And of course, you couldn't. Bill Keller was one of my favorite guys. Yeah. Tell us your funniest story about George Grant. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one because I, don't, I, I won't hurt anybody. And, and he, he tells it himself. He told the story himself. He said, I was sitting up in Coas County when trying a bench trial with, between the two most renowned trial counsel. And at that time, there were about 13 lawyers, and it had to be Hinckley and Gormley. You never mentioned them by name. But Hinckley and John Gormley? Right. Yeah. And, and Grant used to take his dog with him, and he had his dog with him that day. And uh, he said he called the recess, and he wasn't eavesdropping, but the door was ajar. And uh, one lawyer said to the other, what's he got the dog up here for? And the other guy said, I don't know why, but I'd rather have the dog decide the case than him. <laughs> and, <laughs> George t tells that story on himself. He was a, uh, he, he didn't have any pretense, did he? No. George Grant. No. Tell us about Bill Keller. Oh, I, Bill was great. I mean, you know, he was you know, so fair and uh, uh, he was uh, really a good scholar. And I remember him uh, telling me, I, I happened to look up in one of the New Hampshire reports in the last hanging we had. 
in uh, New Hampshire. I don't know if you knew it, but Bill Keller was uh, prosecutor. No, he was a de okay. uh, defense counsel with John Hurley uh -huh. from uh, Manchester. What was the fellow's name again? He was killed a little boy up in Laconia. Long. Yeah, Long. Howie Long. And uh, he told me that the night of the execution, he came down to visit him, and that the Long wanted him to witness it, and he didn't want to. I had, Bill had a lot of compassion. He was a very quiet man and uh, very erudite, too. Yeah. And it was a pleasure to try. I tried cases before him as a lawyer, and it was a pleasure. He was one of my favorite guys. Uh, now, I noted uh, that uh, your trial uh, practice uh, book was dedicated to Carl Randall. Let's talk about clerks a minute. Oh, you? i I tell you a good story about Carl. Um, Carl was another guy like Herbie Ash. You know, uh, he had lost part of his foot, too, in World War II. And uh, being a fellow infantryman, I had a lot of uh, affinity towards him, I guess. But one, uh, one of the stories about Carl is I was sitting in um, Keene, New Hampshire, the September term and until Thanksgiving. And just before I went over there, uh, somebody called up a uh, prospective juror, and uh, he had a job that he could sit the next term, but not this term. And, and so I said, well, I'll call Carl up. So I called Carl up, and Carl was very gracious. You know, he said, what's his name? Where does he live? And I thought that was the end of the story. So the Sunday before I come back to Manchester, 3 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from Carl. And he's quite upset, and he had a few. And he said, who's running this damn court? You or me? I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> he was still mad that I had. Uh, Excuse the jury. Called him yeah. about the jury, and he was right because I was not the presiding judge. It should have been a presiding judge. So I says, I, when I saw him Monday, I said, Carl, could you call it a more opportune hour? <laughs> and Jenny was on the line telling him, that's right, Carl, tell him. <laughs> but he was a great guy. Yeah. Uh, other clerks that you have memories of? We had the greatest, when I was on, I don't see, I don't know about now, but Charlie Connors, uh, he was a great clerk, and uh, Dick Keefe, and uh, my favorite one is, I like, I love them all, but Herbie Callahan was, and the, the fellow you had up there, Bob Tilton. Yeah. We were very lucky to have these people. Samaha. Yeah. Now what, what was their role historically back then when you were? Uh, uh, they taught us. You know, you go on a bench and you, you listen to them. They, they knew what was going on. And in a very nice way and a uh, very diplomatic way, as, as a new judge, they would kind of break you in, you know? Now, Marty, comment on their uh, role uh, in a, uh, as a master in a lot of these domestic uh, temporary orders and the like as contrasted from the formal marital master program now. Do you have any recollection? Uh, oh, sure. They, they uh, when we had, you know, especially on temporary uh, hearings and uh, if we had a jury case going over too much work, they would pitch in. They did a great job. You know, and maybe it's wrong, but in a way, like the old English law with the old jurors, you had to know something about the case. That perhaps they knew these people too, and they they did a great job. Give us some comments on some of the uh, old timers in Manchester, uh, Dene and Dene. Well, I was with Conrad. Right. I practiced with Conrad right. for five. Yeah, th this seems incredible. This was a 19, April 1st of 53, I started with Dene, and he was a, a, a county attorney part-time, believe it or not. And today, uh, McDonough's got about 12 assistants. And he did the job part-time, yeah. very practical. He could never, of course, he could cope today. And the other, uh, oh, Jack Sheehan, he's a legend. And uh, what was his nickname? I don't think. Did he have a nickname? Uh, I was no, just, no, I don't think no. so. And Bill Finney, remember Bill? Yes, with his watch uh, chain on his yeah, vest. Yeah. yeah, and they're all great lawyers, great trial lawyers. And I remember Tommy Leonard, the the father. I don't know if, know if you knew him. Okay. Have things changed in that regard? I think so. I think maybe we got too big. And uh, I remember as a young lawyer, um, uh, I had to bring a minority stockholder suit. And I called up Bill Finney and said, you know, I asked him if I could. He was very busy. And could I go over and look at one of his old files to, to make out a writ, how to do it? And 
He says, come on over any time. And I walked over there. There was about five or six clients waiting for him. And I talked to his secretary. And I said, you know, I talked to Bill. And he says, yes, I know that. If you can scrape up an old file for me, you know, I'd like to go in the library and look at it. So she rang Bill. He says, come on in. And I said, Bill, there's about five clients out there. He said, the hell with it. He sat down with me for a half hour, went right through it. You know what I mean? And uh, Morris Broderick, remember Morris? On Workman's Comp. I called him up one time with a question, and he spent an hour with me going over a case. I don't know, is that prevalent today? I, it's been 32 years. Your impression is that it wouldn't be? I don't know. I have to ask you. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't From think what I works. hear, I, yeah. I, I think it's negative. Yeah. Uh, have you uh, followed at all this concept of developing inns of court to try to get that kind of spirit back into the bar? Yeah, I've been, I've been invited to I've gone to a couple of meetings. I think that's a, very good. I was very interested in it. What would your advice be to the, uh, the uh, bar these days uh, as to things that would would bring civility to it? Very simple. Try to get along. You know what I mean? I, I, since I've been up here, this is worse. It's, uh, they bury you with paper, you know, and uh, needless hearings, people coming in, it's costing you the client's money, uh, the council uh, money. And it's, it's, I can see it getting to the point of being ridiculous. Let's switch over to your federal uh, uh, judge's uh, role. Uh, Marty, uh, and you were talking about paperwork, and I know one of the uh, cases that you've sat on uh, for some time was the Otati Goss case. Right. Uh, tell us about that. That case started on May 15, 1980. It was the longest EPA case ever tried in the country. I, I made a mistake. I bifurcated it, and I had 185 trial days. And if stress could cause cancer, that case did it to me, I think. And it finally, <sighs> final stipulation was filed in December 1993. It had over 45,000, uh, I, I, the transcript was unbelievable. 45,000, yeah, 45,000 pages because Breyer alluded to that in the opinion when it went down the First Circuit. That was a nightmare. And the, uh, the First Circuit uh, did what with your decision? Actually, they sustained me on every point but one minor point, and it was where I assessed damages against the government. Uh, uh, and then that was settled before I came back on a remand. That was settled. Would you then look back, uh, obviously, in terms of uh, length of time at your uh, major case, in terms of the jurisprudence, uh, how would you rank it? Oh, very complicated. You remember, I think t the EPA laws it really started to evolve about 1979, and I got the case in 1980. Now it's tried on the administrative record. But I had 22 attorneys and for the defendant, for the defendants, and, and the government, there were three from the Justice Department. Then we had the town of Kingston was involved in the state of New Hampshire. So I had about 30 attorneys in all. And it was Really, the case was tried well because I had great counsel. It was direct recross, and that's it. And especially defense counsel, and sometimes the town of Kingston or the state, uh, they wouldn't get into the same questions and waive their examination. Now, for the benefit of a future audience, we're talking about the uh, uh, an EPA case under the so-called Superfund law. Right. And uh, in that case, uh, was this the Conway? Uh, a barrel case, so-called. You got a hell of a memory. Yeah, yeah Conway's the one that started off in about 1959. And the principal uh, defendant was out in Chicago. Yeah, that was Stanley Brown's client. Yeah. And uh, what was deep pocket? Deep pocket. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> he paid about eight million. Now we're here in um, August of 1995, and there's a. Uh, heated discussion going on about the uh, revision to the Superfund law. Uh, your uh, words of wisdom on that subject. Well, I think it's the most, one of the most unfair laws. In other words, you can buy a property, as you know, and Margaret could have polluted it 20 years ago, and you're responsible. And uh, 
I, I, there's so many, you know, that, that law could be revised so much. Marty, uh, that was obviously a, a long, long case. You have a reputation uh, uh, amongst the bar uh, members uh, as being the judge to try a Social Security case, too. Did you know that? No. Uh, you've had I think they're most important. I really, they're, you know, actually there's a law, and uh, a lot of people are not cognizant of it, that they get priority. And when I first came up here, I had 16 of them pending because, you know, Shane had come in, he was overloaded because, you know, bounds had gone down the First Circuit. And between myself and my clerk, we got them out within a month. It sounds incredible. I couldn't do it today. But they are the most important. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Uh, that is a, um, a tribute to you because yeah. they feel that you uh, have a sense of fairness uh, on that. Uh, your perception of the, of the, uh, of that process? Is it uh, basically fair to the claimant? No. Uh, there's too much of hiatus. In other words, <coughs> you can file a claim and, uh, today and you go through all the ramifications before you get to an administrative law judge. Then you get to the appeals council. Uh, I'm assuming you're losing a case. Of course, you wouldn't be up here. And sometimes uh, two years transpire. And what, what's the claimant going to do? in all this time. You know, the indigent, I'm talking about the worthwhile cases too. And the buyer is reticent to take these cases because right. they can't even get paid without a final order, right? Well, actually, no. You can get 25, uh, at least you get 25 percent of the total. But only uh, on a successful. Right. That's right. So and, they're and contingent get, even at that. Right. You get a fellow, an attorney like Ray Kelly, and I Kudos to him. He's a great guy. He and you know, he's a specialist in it, and he. A lot of lawyers will not take it. I think they're very important cases. Marty, if you had to uh, uh, point out, say, three members of the bar who you have seen over your career as uh, contributing to the administration of justice, who comes immediately to mind? G three is. A lot I gave more. you three to give you a little latitude. Or um, you mean an ability? No, ad to the administration of justice, to progress, to uh, carrying out the finest tradition of the uh, bar. Not necessarily the best advocate. Okay, but all right. Who, uh, who's contributed most to uh, mankind uh, through the judicial process? In New Hampshire. In New Hampshire. Well, I put David Nixon. David Nixon does a lot of things that people are not aware of. Uh, he started a committee in Manchester, and I'm proud to be part of it to help lawyers who had problems, you know, due to illness and other matters, you know, uh, alcoholism, something like that. Um, another one that comes to mind, and uh, you probably don't know much about him, but I, he, so much charity he's done is Jim Winston and Jack Middleton. It is more. But you asked for three. Uh, yes, and I wanted who came quickly to mind. Right, that was a, those kind three. Of a, yeah. uh, uh, Marty, uh, we've been talking about uh, bench trials, uh, like the Social Security stuff and the EPA stuff and, and those contempt hearings up at uh, Woodsville and the Dartmouth College case. Uh, but you've had a lot of jury work over these years. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us uh, if, what you think of uh, the jury process. I think it's great. Re you know, it's amazing. Um, like I said, I'm trying a patent case, and I've had very, very difficult cases, you know, that I have trouble comprehending. And overall, I'm talking overall, about 95% of the time, they come out with real great verdicts, just verdicts. There's cases when they don't, but that doesn't mean that they're wrong and I'm right. I, I, the jury said, you know, we got it from England, right? And now you can't get a jury trial in England except what, on libel cases or is very limited now. And the jury system, I think, is just great. What's your funniest uh, recollection of a jury uh, uh, <laughs> situation? <laughs> well, <laughs> had a case up in Lancaster, and it was a B and E case. Two, two defendants had broken into the American Legion, and they had borrowed about 40 fifths, you know, and so trying a case and they're introduced into evidence. 
So after the uh, final arguments of counsel, uh, about an hour and a half it transpired, and my bailiff came. He said, you know, Judge, he says, that's a pretty happy jury there. Found out that they were imbibing, they were drinking the evidence. <laughs> so I had a mistrial after five days. <laughs> uh, Marty, uh, uh, the jury's function is to find, uh, uh, in a criminal case, somebody uh, uh, innocent or, or guilty. But once uh, they've found somebody guilty and you get to the sentencing function, tell me, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the contrast between the, if any, between the Superior Court and the Federal Court and, and your thoughts on the matter? On sentencing? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think the sentencing guidelines went in effect November 1st, 1987. I may be wrong. They're abomination. Um, one of the perks about being a senior judge, I took senior status in 1989, was the ability to say I take no more criminal cases because it's ridiculous. Everybody goes to jail. All discretion is gone from the sentencing judge. The U.S. attorney has more power than a sentencing judge. And I g give you an example. It wasn't my case. It was Shane's, where you had a drug dealer who got 20 years, and a mule's got seven. The drug dealer cooperated with the U.S. attorney and had his sentence reduced to three years. Now, is that fair? Uh, I've been reversed. I know I've been reversed. I don't know how many times, but uh, uh, by going beneath the guidelines, and they come back to me. And I, I just I think it's very unfair. I think the Truth and Sentencing Act in the um, state courts. Of course, that came after I left. I think that's boomeranged. You take a look at the state prison. There's 1,700 people up there, and it's supposed to be 900 people. And uh, before, when I sentenced a man to state court, if I gave him three to seven, I knew that if he behaved himself, he's going to get out one third of the minimum, two years. And then if he gave blood, he'd get 20 days off. Or, and they had other uh, limitations. Now they go up there, and I'm not talking about the hardened criminal. I'm talking about all criminals. They go up there now, they, they got to serve their minimum. And then, of course, if they don't behave, it comes off their max. So three to 10, theoretically, and there are some that are going to do the full 10 years. But there's no incentive uh, for them. They may be on the max. I suppose you could argue that way. And it has boomeranged, as we all know, because there's no more room at the end. I don't know whether or not that answers your question. Uh, let me say one other thing. Outside of custody in domestic case, the worst, the hardest, the most onerous part of this job is to sentence somebody. You know, you can, you're talking, you know, you may say a variance between three, five, six, seven years. You're talking about a person's life. You know what I mean? And uh, I hope that when you come in in the morning, you had a good breakfast and you're not sentencing because your stomach's growling. Uh, your record, and uh, in fact, I think you've gone uh, public uh, on that whole subject, uh, speaks uh, uh, volumes of your humanity. Uh, at the same time, uh, you have a reputation, I think, for having great empathy for the victim. And I'm correct, am I not, that you did some of the sentencing in the Stuart Myers case? Yes. And uh, in that case, uh, uh, you, uh, during the sentencing process, uh, uh, actually uh, referred to some victims who uh, had been built of their life savings by uh, Stuart yeah, Myers. Yeah, I had Stuart. I, had Stuart. Yeah. I didn't sentence Myers. Uh, and uh, He's back again, you know. Yes. Now, <laughs> uh, tell us about your uh, uh, thoughts in terms of the victim. Now, when you f let me back off a bit. When you initially sat in the uh, Superior Court, there were no such things as victim advocates, and uh, unless you had some input through the probation uh, department that might have it in its report, you wouldn't have any uh, connect as a judge uh, to the victim's point of view. Is that a fair statement? That's true. And, and uh, now uh, that's come uh, uh, forward quite a bit, and uh, uh, your perception, uh, do you as a uh, judge think it's uh, helpful to have the victim input? I do, really. You know, you just get one side of it. And uh, 
if I can just digress, it's probably not germane to this, but one of the most difficult cases I had was, in I think it was 1971, uh, the Die Hard Motorcycle Gang. And that was a rough case. I went about three weeks. There was about, we tried them all together, about 12. And I'll be frank, I carried a gun uh, during that, that period of time, and they threatened, uh, they never threatened me, but they threatened Jim Connors. Jim was a county attorney. And that case is uh, very vividly in my mind. Do you think from the perspective of a, ju of a judge, uh, and uh, obviously you've raised a large family and you've been a member of the same community for most of your life, if not all your life, uh, do you have any perception uh, as to a change in the level of violence? And uh, what would you attribute that to? Well, there's no question. I don't think today that there is a much more violence. Um, I don't know what to attribute to, to be honest. Uh, they talk about, you know, TV shows and the violence on TV, but I, I will, I guess I can answer. I think it's the lack of morality. Uh, people not going to church and, you know, it comes right down to that, the basic uh, Ten Commandments and the sense of values. Uh, Marty, you were uh, brought up in a parochial school system, right through college then. No, uh, actually when I, I lived in South Manchester, we had no Catholic uh, grammar school down I there. See. They do now. So I went to a public grammar school. But then to a Catholic, Catholic high, school. high school. And a Catholic, and a Catholic college. Yeah. college. Yeah. Now somewhere along the line, uh, you did something other than uh, study and practice and uh, judge the law. You uh, had some uh, interest in swinging something. Oh yeah, I played a lot of tennis. Yeah, yeah. tell us about that, Marty. Well, I, I, took, I played a lot of baseball. I played Legion in high school and Sunset League. And uh, I always thought tennis was kind of a sissy sport. And when I got out of the service after the Korean War, I think it was, I started tennis when I was 30. And I had a lot of good matches up in Laconia. Yeah. A lot of good players up there. Who were some of your uh, tennis foes? Oh, from Laconia. Oh, God. Lance McNell. Well, he was from New Hampton. New Hampton. Yeah, he was yeah. the uh, yeah, Lakes Lance, Region champion all yeah, the time. Yeah, Lance McNell. I played yeah. Lance in a state tournament, I think, my second year, but there was a lot of good players up there. Did you played in tournament yeah, uh, level? Yeah, uh, I never got very far. Yeah. Not in the state level, I did in the city. I have a recollection that bar meetings, the summer bar meetings, you'd be uh, very active in the tennis tournaments that they'd have back then. And yeah. Is that a yeah. fair recollection? Play with Dick Fernall and Judge Morris, Tom yeah. Morris, yeah. Do you, are you still able to? Oh, yeah. yeah. I have uh, a clay court in my backyard, so uh -huh. I play about three times a week. Who do you play with now? Well, uh, I don't think you know any of the fellows named Frank Churis, a fellow named Marino. Frank was former a doubles champion, a state champion, and Don Richet. Uh, a lot of, I don't think the names, you, you know who they are. But members of the community. Oh, yeah. yeah. So have you been able, uh, Marty, over the years uh, to uh, maintain your contacts with your community, notwithstanding the need to uh, be seen as impartial and uh, aside from the, the community in a way as a judicial well, I, officer? I think you have to, as you know, you have to take a kind of a low profile. I can't get involved directly in any uh, associations and stuff like that or run for office. Before I went on a bench, I was a cemetery trustee and on a water commission and a few others, you know, but you got to be pretty circumspect once you go on a bench, as you know. Who's the person you, uh, in your lifetime, have come to respect more than any other person? My wife, Margaret. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, Marty, uh, is there something that I haven't covered that you think we should really... No, I think you did a great job. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you very okay. much. Okay, yeah.